Our final speaker for the day is John Cumming. John is the ACT's inaugural Chief Digital Officer. His mission is to drive the digital agenda and to lead the whole of government digital strategic direction to ensure that the ACT public service is digitally innovative, dynamic and capable in its service to the community. John previously held the position of Chief Information Officer for the New Zealand Department of Corrections, where he transformed the department's approach to IT with the creation and implementation of a new digital technology strategy. Please welcome John. Thank you very much. Uh, a couple of things I should warn you. One is that um, I don't have a problem with buffering. In fact, generally the audience would like me to do a bit more buffering <laughs> along the way. And secondly, I sometimes ramble on, so I've just got a timer here. Hopefully it will keep me a little more on track. Um, so thank you for doing the acknowledgement of country earlier, but I would like to add my personal acknowledgement to the Ngunnawal people, where we are, and, and pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people and the culture and the elders. Um, so I should also warn you probably that people who come up with lots of picture slides are going to give you a lot more opinion than those that turn up with words or no slides who have a lot more facts to hand. So um, you're going to get a lot of opinions from me. And it's a pretty intimidating audience and to be invited to come and speak to because, you know, um, it reminded me of, um, I had a f colleague called Greg Patchell in New Zealand a long time ago, and one day I just turned around to him arbitrarily and said, Gregory? And he turned around with that look of fear in his face, and I knew in that moment that that's exactly what his mother called him when he'd been bad. <laughs> and similarly, when somebody sort of says to me, shh, I know it's a librarian, it's sort of wired into my DNA, that sort of long back into your child, even though libraries have changed a lot, and I've certainly changed a lot, some things just wired into your DNA. So that's why it's intimidating, because what do I know? <laughs> so to be clear about this, if this is the sort of cumulative knowledge in the room, this is what I know, and it's not very much. It's a tiny speck on the landscape. So I'm just going to wander randomly around. I'm sort of going to keep to a bit of a script, but everybody before me has been wise and spoken great words that I kind of feel I'll just sort of wander off and try not to talk about the things that have already been talked about. But I do know a bit about digital, and uh, it starts with two things that I've, I've discovered. And any job for a uh, chief digital officer will come up with these two things. The first is customer. Now there's disruption. And the first thing about customer, it's not just the people who are online, but certainly in a government space, the customer is everybody. It's absolutely everybody, because a government has a responsibility uh, to everybody. Uh, Organisations are set up, you know, Uber sets up, they uh, focus purely on the digital space, and that's cool, but we're government, we have responsibility to everybody. The other thing about digital is disruption, and let's face it, there's enough of that going on. So. Here's my prejudice and my uh, of what's been going on around libraries. So, uh, public library, access to free knowledge, and traditionally there's books, and then there's a whole lot of other stuff that sort of turned up, and I'm sure there's, there's more things. And one of the more interesting ones is, um, gets into civic services uh, in, a, in a broader sense, and also into connectivity, which we've heard many people talk about the importance of. And, and in my mind, at least, there's the, these people called librarians, and they're the navigators. They help us navigate our way around these sources of knowledge and the thing that is a library. And increasingly, if, if it's, a, it's a virtual library, then you know, that's, they're still our navigators. Along came the internet, and the sort of immediate reaction to this was that, um, like for many other businesses, this was uh, going to really just get rid of libraries. Why would we need them anymore? And certainly, why would we need navigators to that online world? It's sort of, it was relatively fresh and small and everybody was getting onto it, so that was terrific. And there was a kind of, is that it moment? Um, there's a f those of you who have been to Wellington, um, uh, if there's a famous bookstore called Parsons that has been there since I can remember, uh, and there's pictures of it in the 50s and all the rest of it. And about 18 months ago, it closed down. And it was one of these bookstores that had the beautiful books to just go through. People would go there at lunchtime just to look through stuff. It was a cultural icon of Wellington, and the building needed upgrading, earthquake strengthening. It's just gone. And then suddenly there was a big hole, and it's not until it's you know the Joni Mitchell song, you don't know you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And it was kind of one of those, how did that happen? And it did because what happened to the book market? What happened if it sold CDs, esoteric CDs that you would never see in the top ten? But they were beautiful things. We have many of them. 
Uh, and you look at travel officers and there's an all-time classic digitization is Kodak who just did not see it coming and did not embrace the new digital world and did not adapt and they're gone. But there's always there's a bit more to it than that because people uh, are always going to need navigators. Uh, and you've heard much of the talk earlier on about, you know, people, it's the kids aren't the problem, it's the parents. How do you catch up with this? And I have to say, this is one of the most beautiful photographs we have in our, in our library. It, it is just, I, I go back and look at it several times and it's just a stunning image that, said, that speaks to me directly. It is about customer service and that includes the responsibility for being inclusive. You don't get instruction books with, with your laptop. You don't get instruction books with Facebook and, and all those things. You just have to kind of figure it out. And for some people who have a, come from a digital culture, the millennials, if you like, that's pretty easy. So let's look at the disruption stuff. And, I, and I'm kind of cautious now about going through a lot of this because um, there's been quite a lot of negative talk today about digital, online, danger, warning. And so I'll still talk about it. But I just want to emphasise that there's a heck of a lot of positive stuff as well. Um, the digital divide, we've talked about that, so I won't go on. But I would also add that 80% of homeless, just under 80% of homeless people nationwide have access on mobile phones to the internet and the services they need. So in that sense, there are some digital bridges, but there is a huge digital divide. Uh, New Zealand used to be... Um, we used to beat ourselves up for being rubbish when it came to internet connectivity. And I have to say, coming here, I've been disappointed. The mm -hmm. connectivity is not good, it is hard to get, and it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of work to be done, in my view, to, to catch up with this, that small country across the ditch. There comes a disenfranchisement with that if you're not part of the digital world, um, where are you? And the identity vulnerability simply means if you're not playing in that space, then others will be only too happy to go and play in there for you and be you in that space. And if you're not there yourself, that becomes increasingly easy for them to do. Did you know, if you read the Canberra Times, you will know, uh, that Canberra, despite us being the smartest bunch of people in the country, that's a fact apparently, um, we have the highest incidence of uh, being scammed. So here we are, we're smart, we still get scammed. I have a close relative who I would consider a very, very smart person. Uh, he was scammed, warned him, this is not good, you're not, you know, still went ahead and lost a lot of money. Smart people get scammed and one needs to have a special kind of uh, instinct around this. It is not about your intelligence. And of course, that's half the, half the deal when people get into these things. They don't know how to get out with their ego. It's, it's an embarrassment. Um, there's an increasingly a service squeeze um, that you can only get certain things. How do you get an Uber, a cheap taxi ride, if you like, um, without a mobile phone if you're not connected? Some of those services are just disappearing. Um, and in the retail retreat side, I know the Canberra Mall gets bigger and malls get bigger, but you look at them, they are of a type of retail service. And even the mainstays like Dick Smith, of course, as we all know, that's disappearing. The, the retail space that people who aren't digitally engaged are actually retreating. It's getting harder and harder to do these things. And even with, um, so for me, uh, you know, coming to the country for the first time, you know, I'm, I was here 20 years ago, so it's not as if I'm new, but it's as if I was new. And I have hearing technology, and getting a replacement part for that was cost $70. I mean, they're not cheap. I don't know how people who aren't well off afford the sort of basic technology to hear properly. Um, Getting that is getting harder and harder. You know, I can go into a shop and have a consultation and get charged $150 for having a hearing consultation when all I want is the bit that plugs into it re replace the old one that you have to replace every, every 12 months. So it's increasingly getting hard to have a sort of a simple, easy uh, retail exchange. Cultural dilution comes in many, many forms. Um, and, and it's very important, I think. Um, and there's the obvious cultural dilution. So. Everything is kind of Americanized online because that's the biggest base uh, of, of English speaking language. And I rail against spelling and spell checkers and people who spell with American spelling. I have to say, coming across the ditch, I've had to go from program with MME on the end to no ME, and it drives me nuts. But I'm doing it because I've made a vow if I go and live in America, I'll spell like the Americans. If I'm in Australia, I'll spell like the Australians. But I sort of have a, a, an English kind of 
background, which makes me want to spell like that. But it's getting all Americanized. Z's keep turning up all over the place. And, and it, but it goes deeper than that, the way we think about things. And that sort of Western way of thinking is quite culturally divisive in terms of, for example, New Zealand Maori or in terms of Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And you don't realise until you go through some process of reconciliation, in a sense, of just how different the frame of reference is. And suddenly you can create an exclusion without even noticing it. Now, that's a whole other topic that I'm not going to go into, and it's, I'm lucky I don't understand the politics of Australia yet. I like to stay that way. Um, but it is a big deal, that cultural uh, dilution. And, of course, it comes between old and new, the, the cultural dilution of a book that you touch and feel. How, how much of that, of going through a, an old book, is cultural? For me, it's a lot. It, to touch that page is cultural. It's not just physical. Uh, and, of course, this change panic, where people sometimes uh, get into the, the, the change uh, and they just, I can't do it. And relatively young and intelligent people who can do it just get into a panic and I can't do it, I won't try, because I don't want to fail, so I won't. And, and that's a really hard thing to get past with, with some people. And so there are going to be people on the margins that we have to care for. So in terms of a library, to borrow an exchange, what the hell are you, I think was the expression, but it may be slightly wrong. Uh, in a what is a librarian? And it's probably all of these things, I think, these days. Um, because the world of musty books has changed dramatically. But in some ways, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, there has always been change, and there will always be change. And my experience has been that when we embrace change and look for its benefits, and not just do all the negatives like the list I've been going through, that's actually where we find the value, and that's how we stay ahead, and that's how we get value from it. We are not necessarily going to have digital things for people who are never going to engage with digital in the sense that we understand it. But we sure as hell have a lot of digital tools to help with that. We can do assisted digital, if you like, where we're not asking people to, to subtly learn things. We can work with them, we can work alongside them, we can navigate for them uh, into getting used to these things. And in some ways, it's just the tools. You know, there, there are some immense challenges, I mean, um, uh, in terms of access and so on and so forth, but digital has to be seen in a positive light and something that we should absolutely embrace. Because digital is more than just being online. Now, why did the term ever, ever come up? Why did people get onto digital? And, and for me, it was a couple of things. One is it came out of crisis, um, that there was a global crisis with IT and it needed a new way of looking at it and digital was what came out of it. And it started being, being run by the technical people and that was not a good thing. You never want technical people running your online experience, your digital experience. And so that's why I'm a, that's why I'm a chief digital officer, not a chief information officer. The beauty is I don't get texts in the weekend telling me what's broken in the infrastructure. It's fantastic. Um, OK. Uh, so it brings all the new opportunities. Now, we've talked a bit about the, the exclusion. And, and you know, even in the urban areas, we have a long way to go. Mobile. Uh, the cost in New Zealand, sorry to refer back, but it's a reference point for me, is half that on mobile of what I pay in Australia. If I look at house internet connection, it's about 20% more here than in New Zealand. It is not cheap. And I haven't even touched rural broadband, and I've heard some people talking about that, and I just go, how are we going to do that? The technology is not there to provide good rural broadband. And it means that those rural communities are the ones that could benefit most for us. Actually, the things that we do digitally, digitally and online, all this, for most of us here, is kind of our first world problem. But actually, we are in real danger, if we don't get that connectivity and access, of creating a third world country within a first world country. So we can go from excluded to getting access, so on and so forth, up to education, empowerment, and engagement. Now, the empowerment and engagement is kind of interesting. I mean, that sounds all nice and lovey-dovey and terrific. Um, in a sense, that's what we want. But it also comes with the good and the bad things. Um, this is disruptive technology. This is new stuff. We don't know where it's going. It is being driven by the crowd. It is not stage managed. And what is popular is driven by the crowd. I would never have picked Facebook as being the winner and all that. I thought the user interface when it came out was absolute rubbish. But it did. 
And there's been all sorts of... And timing is everything. I mean, there was a company, I can't even remember its name, that came out before YouTube that essentially did exactly what YouTube did, but it came out just before massive broadband rollout in the US. And they folded. Right at that moment, broadband rolled out, YouTube came up, massive success, very, very quickly. Uh, there are so many things that drive it, but it also comes with the bad behaviours. It's like everything else in life. Just because we've had cars for how many years we've had them and sophisticated laws and understanding of how things work, that doesn't mean to say we don't have reprobates ripping up and down the federal highway at speeds as a lunatic and killing people. Of course we do. We have people falling asleep at the wheel. You know, they're not even bad people, they're just bad things happen. And it's exactly the same in the digital world. We should not pretend it doesn't. But we should not let those bad negative things outweigh the good that we seek in it. So, digital opportunities. And I just want to talk about some of these, and I don't really understand what I'm talking about, um, uh, which is one of the benefits of being a CDO. You don't have to. CIOs have to. But CDOs, you just have opinions. It's terrific. Um, so here's some things I think that, that, that you should think about. And um, So, human-centred design is a big thing with digital, and you would have, if you've listened to any of the DTO, Paul Shetler stuff, you would have heard about human-centred design. And it's one of the bridges past the... Intermediation, the intermediation and the sort of the getting rid of the access barriers is that we should be able to do any task with government online without any instructions instinctively and get it right first time, as it were. That's the goal. So increasingly, it's getting easier and easier to do things. I mean, back in the day when PCs were first out, you kind of need to be a bit of a geek to make it work. Something would break every few days unless you had a geek in the family or paid a lot of money for one. These days, it just happens. iPads, they sort themselves out, and it just happens. Increasingly, the services there will go like that. It will become increasingly easy to go online and go onto your mobile devices and just do stuff. And I think the key to that is understanding how people behave. Whilst it's true that Henry Ford said, you know, if, if I'd asked people what they wanted, uh, they would have just asked for faster horses. So I invented the car. That's terrific. But actually, to some degree with this, we let ourselves be fooled by that, thinking that we at the centre and the designers, we know best of how people work. We don't. We need to engage with the public on how they do things, how they want to do things, because we have very set mindsets on, on how things should work. And technical people are the worst. You never let a technical person design a website. It's horrible. Um, citizen co-creation is part of that. How do you work with the citizens to actually create value in whatever it is you do? Is that data? Is it collections? Is it whatever? Um, I mean, one of the things I want for our um, uh, uh, data lake stuff is to be able to absorb community information like bird sightings, for example, and make that available as open community data. And, and what's, what role are you going to play in that? Can you play a role? The digital archive, that's very straightforward. You know, what do we keep, what don't we keep? I have this rule of thumb that annoys people. It says, if it was printed on a laser printer, just scan it and get rid of it. If it wasn't printed on a laser printer, then there may be some value in its physical representation, but uh, laser printers don't do anything for me. Uh, data advocacy, what data do we need, what should we make available? We talk about open data and, and government is awfully cagey about you know, what data we release because it's hard work. Um, so are you going to advocate for the citizens that you engage with every day about what data they need to see? I think you should. Uh, data curation is, is kind of, you know, we curate all sorts of things. It's kind of like a museum term, but I think the, the, the mass of information, I mean, goodness me, Mr Tomler's stuff has been... Has been safe for posterity. We absolutely need some good curation around that. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I've gone on the radar and I don't think anybody going to store anything in mind because it doesn't make any sense. Um, so anyway, there's, there's lots of roles and I think it's a longer conversation that we've got time for um, to talk about some of those things. Um, but I do want you to be demanding and demanding on behalf of your customers. I've got a whole other slide deck which I almost wish I bought but time is of the essence, which is as Australians, we are not demanding enough of digital services of access to these progress. We need to be far more demanding in people's faces. And I know there will be politicians who think um, that probably we are in their faces and there will be telcos. You know, I sort of rail at telcos and embarrass myself at times. It can be much better. We should be demanding, and not just in the digital space, in all services that we get, we should be far more demanding. Why? Why am I doing this? Uh, I've got an internet company and I ring them up, they ask me for my password. You're an internet company, I'm not going to tell you my password, you shouldn't know it, but they do. If an internet company's behaving like that, what hope have the rest of us got? It's just outrageous, I complain, you should complain. Complaining is positive, if it's a constructive way. Um, I have to fill in a tax return on paper. I've had a tax file number for 25 years. 
I have to fill in a tax return on paper because I've been away a while, and the only way I can re-energise my account is by filling in, a, filling in a paper form. I can't read my own writing. How are they going to read it? I don't know. I just... And I said, what? So loudly that my EA coming, came rushing in to see if I'd had a medical event. I want you to be demanding and, and don't give up. It's very easy to say, oh, never get there. Keep at it. You know, have therapy groups. This is what I'm doing here. I'm having therapy. <laughs> Make sure you keep at it. Right, so be the advocate. So crowd sorcerer. You have access to crowds. Make magic with that. That's a, that's a huge bit. I mean, probably only nurses but they're sick then, uh, well not the nurses, the people they deal with, and, and, and teachers, and they're a narrow thing, have that kind of access to people. And that's very powerful. I mean, if you've got the power of teachers, wow, you're onto it. Uh, Customer-centric, you know our customers, particularly the ones who are on the margins often, who don't have this stuff. You know, that's an important role. Getting people in franchise, user centred design, access to services and data. And fundamentally, you, you should be our reality check about what's going on in the real world, because you are in the real world. Now my time has gone red, so I must come into land. So, it's not certain that everything is uncertain. So, yeah, it's very easy to say it's all just a mare, and it's kind of, um, nobody really knows what's going to happen. To some degree that's true, but we, we can't control it. We can only nudge it. And, and that was a phrase used earlier. And I, and I think we need to collectively nudge it because there is no longer as much central power to direct as there was before. The digital world has changed that. So be one of the nudges, please. And if you think everything is certain or somebody tells you that everything is certain, I would like you to remind them this, of this anagram because I think it's important. <laughs> Thank you.